The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Well, good morning and welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have joined us today for the third Sunday of Advent as we celebrate the joy of Christ's birth. Uh, this morning, I would remind you to take out that yellow card that is in your bulletin. Please fill that out. And along with any tithes and offerings that you might have with you this morning, you can place that in the basket as you are leaving the sanctuary today. We do have a few other announcements for you. Hopefully, when you came in this morning, in addition to receiving a bulletin, you also got a little slip of paper. Some of you are probably wondering what that's for. That is for our memory balls. That is a tradition here uh, that during the prayer time, you would write on there somebody that you want to remember today in prayer. It could be anybody. It could be a whole family. Whoever it is, you write that prayer on that little sheet of paper, and then you'll come up here, and we have ornaments in the baskets right up here in the front. Just slide that on the hook, and then you can place those on the Christmas trees here uh, at the uh, front of the sanctuary. Also, we will have the regular lighting of the candle during that time as well. So we wanted to let you know that that is happening today. It's not printed in the bulletin, but we are having the memory balls during the prayer time today. Also want to remind you that our Christmas Eve services are at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. this year. That 4 p.m. is a new service that we are offering this year so that our families can get home with their kids a little bit more uh, earlier and they can get them in their PJs. I know my daughter is excited. She gets her PJs on earlier in the evening so she can wake up even earlier the following morning than she usually does uh, for the Christmas presents. So uh, that is there for our families and we will also have our traditional 7 p.m. service with kids. Communion. Also, this is not in your bulletin, but on January 1st, I've been getting asked this question, you know, this is that odd year where Sundays falls on holidays and it's kind of confusing. What, what are we doing for worship on those days? Well, you know that on Christmas Day, we are not having in-person services, but we will have a YouTube service that will go out to you that day. But on January 1st, we will have one service at 10.30 a.m. That's right here. For you people that show up at 10.30, you don't really have to think much about it. You just get up and come at your normal time. But on January 1st, we invite you to come out for our 10.30 service. Well, that is all the announcements I have for you this morning. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as Jerome comes forward to lead us in our call to worship. We celebrate the coming of the promised one in whom dwells, who dwells the spirit of God. The spirit of wisdom. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and love. We bear witness to the fulfillment of God's promises in Jesus by living in that same spirit. We will open ourselves to the presence of God in our lives and seek to live as God's witnesses to live in peace. It is a reunion. Every time we go home, every time we embrace those we love, no matter how long it has been, it feels like sunrise, like the clouds are parting and the rain has ended. It is joy, nothing less than pure joy to grab hold of those who are home for us, who make home for us. Whether we wake up for them every day or travel many miles to see them again, it is a joy to go home. 
The prophet Zechariah tells us to rejoice at the thought of going home. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else, and then to live like that was our truth even now, even here. It is joy to go home. John the Baptist reminds us, however, that it takes choices to live in this joy. It doesn't just happen. We choose to make life a joy by how we love others, by how we serve and give and care for others, by how we do the job we do, and how we impact the world around us. We build joy as we build a home in this world and the next. We light these candles, the candle of hope, of peace, and of joy as a sign that we are on our way home. And we walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination. And it is pure joy. It is time to go home. Amen. What this time would you please once again rise in body or in spirit as we sing our first hymn, hymn number 219, What Child Is This?
As we continue our worship today, would you turn to hymn number 349, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Now, this is not a Christmas hymn. It's not even an Advent hymn. So why are we singing this hymn today? Well, this is a special hymn because it reminds us in this busy season of the holidays where our focus should be, and that is upon Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we sing this song together, may all of our eyes collectively turn to the one who offers us joy and salvation. We will sing this song together twice through. So let us sing together. But I share with you that the day has come in this moment within our congregation where the doors of the church are now open. As the pastor mentioned, not only can you light candles, but we also ask that you place a note on the remembrance tree. The doors are now open.
Let us pray. O God, you made of one blood all nations, and by a star in the east revealed to all peoples him whose name is Emmanuel. Enable us who know your presence with us so to proclaim his unsearchable riches that all may come to his light and bow before the brightness of his rising, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Dear God, our songs this morning has you alone. What child is this? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Open my eyes that I may see. In this spirit of the coming of the Christmas holiday, we just pray for safety upon your people, that we can extend the hand of peace and not at war, that we can extend love and not hate, that we can welcome the homeless into our homes and feed the hungry and shelter those who need shelter, but more importantly, that we will serve as a point of light of Christian love and what it means in this community and indeed around the world. We ask that you have travel mercies upon those who are traveling the highways and the byways, that you keep them safe from point A to point B. We ask these things in the most sacred and holy name there is. We ask that you pray with me now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the pastor this morning has chosen the book of James, verse, chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. And I was trying to figure out when the last time I read James, and I guess it was today, but it goes as follows. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield the val its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of the patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. I just couldn't wait any longer. I had to sneak a peek. The present had been under the tree for two weeks, and I was getting really stressed out with all of the anticipation of Christmas Day coming and then finally being able to open that present. So as a young kid, obviously this, wasn't, this is not currently describing me right now. I'm a young kid, and, and I'm, I'm there in front of the Christmas tree, and there's a present there for me. It's got my name on it. Now, as a kid, and even as adults, we've become experts at judging the size of a box or a present and knowing kind of what's in there. Like, you all know that box that's shaped like where you're going to get clothes. We all know that box. We avoid that box. We go straight for the other presents. And, and this one, I knew, I was pretty sure I knew what it was. I just didn't know exactly what it was. And I thought... This is a CD. It just had that shape. You know what a CD? You remember those things? They, 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 CDs? And it was back in the 90s, and, and at that time I had asked my parents, I really want the CD by this group named Chumbawamba. I was really excited for it. And they were popular back then. Some of you are like, who's Chumbawamba? Some of you are like, oh yeah, I remember that group. But anyways, I'm like, I'm sure that's it. And so the temptation was just too strong. And so one day, my parents, I don't know, they, I guess they went out of the house or, or whatever, and I got underneath the tree as quickly as I could. 
and I just lifted, and you have to be really gentle with this, right? You don't want to rip too hard because then it's going to be obvious that you got it open and the tape won't go back. And so I just very gently got the tape off, just enough so that on the edge I could look in and peek. And so I, I got underneath and I, I used the Christmas lights to kind of look in there as quickly as possible, and, and I looked in. And to, dis- to say that I was disappointed would be an understatement because it wasn't Chumbawamba. It was the Rolling Stones. Now, I want you to understand, this is the 90s, and even back in the 90s, the Rolling Stones were considered old. So, like, I'm disappointed, like, I'm a, te- like, a young kid, there is no way uh, I would even listen to the Rolling Stones. And so I'm just, like, devastated in that moment, and I put it back, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe my parents were playing, like, they knew I was going to look. And they put the Rolling Stone CD in there to deceive me. I did get the Chumbawamba CD, by the way. It was just in another package that came later that year. And, and every time I think of waiting, I think of that story because I know just how impatient I was as a kid. And even today, I struggle with waiting. It's not just a childhood thing. It's an adulthood thing, too. All of us, we struggle when it comes to waiting patiently for things. Like patience and waiting, they go hand in hand, right? Like you're waiting, you have to be patient, right? That's just the game. And and so when we come upon scripture passages like today that encourage or exhort us to wait, some of us, we just kind of turn off mentally and spiritually. They're like, ah, I don't know if I want to do with this like patience, especially during the holidays. Like, I don't want to wait. I, I, I want all this stuff to come now. And so as we approach a passage like James chapter 5 today, I think we really have three complications or three reasons that we might struggle with the words that James gives us. First of all, the, the first struggle is waiting and being patient. Like, nobody wants to do that these days, right? The second thing is, is that James is writing to a group of people who are currently suffering. They're being persecuted. Their lives are at stake. And so the words to uh, them might not be words that are necessarily applying to us because we're not suffering, at least in the same way that the people back then were. And perhaps the, the hardest thing to deal with in this passage is this whole idea of the coming of the Lord, the return of Jesus. This is something I don't think us Methodists really think about all that often. When's Jesus going to return? Now, during dark times and evil times, it's easy, like, what Jesus just come back? But most of us, we don't spend a lot of time thinking of that. And actually, surveys bear this truth out as well. uh, I read a certain uh, survey this past week uh, about people's beliefs of Jesus' return and how many people in each religious group were expecting Jesus to return. And at Protestants, that's you all, Protestants, 64% of Protestants actually believe Jesus will return someday. Catholics are 63%. And I thought this was comical and slightly fascinating, but 1% of atheists expect Jesus to return someday. Maybe they're just hedging their bets. I don't know. I don't know how you could do that, but whatever. But it doesn't seem that a lot of people are unanimous in believing that Jesus is going to return. So what does all this waiting have to do? What does waiting patiently for the coming of Jesus have to do with us? We're celebrating the first coming of Jesus. We can understand that. But how do we wait for the second coming of Jesus? And I think our struggle is really we have the wrong conception of what waiting is. For most of us, we think of of waiting as like, you know, you put your hands in the pocket and you just wait for something to happen. And that's not at all what James is envisioning when he's telling the people to wait, be patient for the coming of the Lord. You have to understand that the waiting game has a certain nature to it. And biblically, we are called to live out the nature of that game. I mean, you think of any game, they have a nature to it. I've been watching a lot of soccer these past few days because the World Cup's going on. I know for a vast majority of you that's like irrelevant. And I've talked to people about uh, the World Cup and they're like, I just find the sport boring. How can a game end in a tie? And I don't understand why they always pass the ball backwards. Just go towards the goal. Stop delaying it. Just get on with it. Try to score. Why are you passing it backwards? And, you know, if you have to explain a sport, it it really... um, it, it loses its meaning, kind of like trying to explain a joke. And so you're, I'm trying to explain to people, this is why they do that. It's all part of the strategy and, and everything. And people are like, ah, it's still boring sport. But when it comes to waiting, we have to 
we have to understand that there's a, a nature to it. And that's what James is tapping into. See, for us, when it comes to waiting, we come up with a, a, a you know, basically a long list of strategies of distraction. That's the best way we've come up with trying to wait for things. Like when we're in the doctor's office and we're waiting, that's why, hey, maybe I'll just get out my cell phone right now and I'll do that. Or I'll read a book or something like that to distract myself. And when it comes to like the countdowns to Christmas, you know, we're just like, oh, I look forward to that day. Family's coming over and we're just so excited for it. So maybe we try to just not think about it so much so that we're not impatient. I don't know, we come up with a lot of strategies of distraction. And I think what James is trying to encourage the people to do is not come up with strategies of distraction, but rather strategies of action. He wants them to act. They're not just to sit back and wait for this to happen. They are to be patient. They're to encourage one another because the judge is standing at the door. And so if we are going to understand what waiting requires of us, especially patiently waiting, then we have to change our perspective. And really when it comes to it, waiting is a matter of perspective, isn't it? And perspective has this effect on the way that we live and act. How we view something affects how we live something. If we perceive something wrong, therefore, we might not act in a corresponding way that's good. And so if we're going to understand what waiting really requires of us, I want us to ponder this question this morning. When we read James 5, and we know that the people are suffering, their lives are being threatened every day, and they're wondering if they're going to make it. They're wondering if they're going to survive because they're being persecuted by everybody, it seems. And in that context... Why would James say, be patient and waiting for the coming of the Lord? Why would he say that? Doesn't that sound kind of irrelevant or insignificant to people? Like when somebody's suffering, you just say to them, well, be patient. That would seem insignificant, at least to me. But what he's challenging the people to do is not to think like, hey, we're just going to think of this sweet by and by that's going to come in the future and, and that'll, that, that'll nourish our spirits a bit with joy. He's telling them, hey, this thing is going to happen in the future. It's going to happen. And that shapes the way that we are to live right here and right now. That's why he says, don't grumble with one another or don't hold things against other people. Be patient and waiting for God to come. See, often we come to hope, and we think of hope as this thing, it's just all future related, but it doesn't have any present consequences or effects on the present. It's as if hope is just, hey, we, we hope something will happen, good will happen in the future, but that has no bearing on the present. But true hope, the full vision of hope that we are called to live, the same hope that James chapter 5 is tapping into, doesn't leave the present blank. It actually fills it out and allows us to act with purpose when we are doing things in this world. See, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and the understanding that he will come again shapes us up, allows us to live a life shaped by hope. This is not just some future event. It's a present reality. The problem with us often is that we think of, of hope as just this far distant thing. And then we end up thinking of, well, if we're going to live a, a hopeful existence, that we just need to put our heads in the clouds. And unfortunately, sometimes I think when we look at the church, uh, we have people that have their heads in the clouds, but their feet are not on the crown not living the reality of that hope each and every day. See, what James is saying, I don't know the date. I don't know the date, like when Christ is going to come. I'm sure James thought it was going to come soon. But we know when we look back on it, we're like, oh, that obviously didn't happen for them right away, so maybe it's not going to happen in our lifetime either. So what do we do with that? But what James wants us to do is to know the power of that hope, to live into the truth of it. See, he knows it, and it should affect the way that people live in the present. So you might not realize this, but right before this, this passage today in James 5, the first couple verses there in chapter 5, 
are directed towards the wealthy and rich oppressors. And what these wealthy and rich oppressors have been doing, and James has some really harsh words for them. He says, these people, they're withholding the wages from their workers. And they're not giving them a livable wage. They're, they're doing all this. They're exploiting the people, their work, and everything like that. And his word that he offers is a word of judgment. And the reason why he offers that word is that even the wealthy are not going to be uh, able to avoid the coming judgment that is coming with Jesus Christ. And he wants to remind the people that this judge that is standing at the door right now, that affects the way that we live right now. If it affects the wealthy, it, it affects all of us that we're called to live holy lives of purpose and, and really through the way we live, bring glory to God. And so ultimately when it comes to us, the perspective we need with waiting is not just I'm sitting around waiting for this good thing to happen, this Christ to return, which doesn't seem to have a daily relevance to my life each and every day, is that that trains us to live a certain way. And that means that we live with the expectation that God could break through in any moment. And I'm not just talking about God breaking through and returning again, as Scripture says it, but God breaks through in each and every moment, or God can break through in each and every moment. And if we live with that patiently waiting expectation of Christ's return, we're able to clue in on those moments when God is breaking through. That's ultimately what this teaching does to us, is it shapes us into people of expectation. And if we are going to live with expectation, I think the one thing that we need to abide by or to put into practice is the principle of one. It's the sermon title for today, but what is the principle of one? Well, it's simple. Actually, it's really simple. It's just this, that the one moment or one person or one thing or one situation or one opportunity, any of those one things, God can break through and God can move in those moments. And we want to be a people that are able to clue in on those moments. And so the principle of one is teaching us that at any moment in my life, God could be doing something, and I want to be aware of it. This goes contrary to our nature. We often treat each moment as like a stepping stone to something better that we're doing. We treat every person we encounter with that same thing in mind. We go through the grocery store and we say, hi, and how are you doing and all that, but we're just trying to move on to the next task. And what the principle of one is trying to teach us is that in any moment, God could break through or God could do something or God could call us to do something. And by exhorting the people to live with this waiting expectation for God to break through, that shapes us into people who are every single moment aware that God could do something great. And we want to be a part of it. I don't know about you, but if God's doing something in the life of my neighbor or, or God is calling me in this moment to do something, I want to be aware of it. And I want to live with that. So how do we live with this principle of one? How do we put it into practice so that we become a people of expectation? Well, number one, you got to slow down. I'm not talking like physically here, like mentally and spiritually. If you slow down, it's a hard thing to do at the holidays, right? I wrote about this this week. It's hard to slow down when you've got so many responsibilities and things on your Google calendar and you're just doing one thing after another. But I promise you, if we don't slow down, we're going to miss these moments where God breaks through. We also have to live more intentionally about it. That means we have to have this sense, you, you know what, like, I, I want to live this way. I want to be aware of what God is doing in the world. So I need to be intentional about living each moment that way. It also requires us to practice the right things. It's amazing to me how we often think that we're just going to stumble into the right things. Like we're just going to stumble into patience or stumble into gentleness. And some of us, it seems like we, we know people that were just born naturally patient and gentle. I know you've been thinking of some people. But even those people, I tell you, had to put those things into practice. They had to learn it and challenge themselves too. And, and we have to practice the right things as well. The reason why James says to be patient is that when we're patient, we notice a lot more things in life. Think of those times when you're impatient. 
How many things do you notice when you're impatient? Not a lot, because you're just focused on like one thing and you're not aware of what's going on around you. And so James says, put the right things into practice. Put gentleness into practice. Put patience into practice. These things are not only good and of themselves, but they also open you up to God moving around you at all times. That's why you need to be patient. And then most importantly, to practice the principle of one requires us to live with an awareness that God could be present in any moment. There's not a single moment, there's not a single place, there's not a single situation that God couldn't move in. God can move in all things. We know that's the power of God. Yet we as Christians far too often think, oh, like God can't be involved in this situation or God's not going to move in this situation. It's just so bad or so depressing. God's not going to move. But we as Christians are called to live every single moment as if God would not only appear but break through those situations and bring hope and joy or whatever. I wonder, what would, what would it be like if we lived this way? If we truly believe that every encounter with every person that we meet could be an opportunity where God is going to break through and God's going to do something great, how would that change our lives? Now, I want to be clear on this. Living this way is not an invitation to be scary. We've got way too many scary Christians in the world. What do I mean by, by scary? Well, uh, a scary Christian is, is somebody who often just comes off in a way that like rubs people the wrong way. They're like, oh my gosh, this, this person is strange to me. And what God wants is not scary Christians. God wants weird Christians. Because believe me, if you slow down, you live intentionally, you practice the right things, you're gentle, you're patient, if you live with an awareness that God could be present in any moment, you are going to be weird to people around you. They're going to think there's something up with you. There's something weird about you. But that's different than being scary. See, scary Christians are, are often um, people that get overly obsessed about uh, the end times. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, they, like they're obsessed with knowing the date. Like they want to know exactly when it is. And, and they're so obsessed with it, and this is where it becomes scary, is that they lose an awareness of present realities. Like they're not attending to what they need to do here. So their hope is just so oriented to this end time thing that's going to happen that they don't display the virtues of love and kindness to people around them. That's a tendency that happens with scary Christians. Another way that you can be a scary Christian is try to force spiritual breakthroughs in situations. To live with an awareness that God could be present in any moment is not an invitation to try to force a spiritual breakthrough on somebody or in a situation. It's all God's initiative, and we're just there to be used. So we don't want to, like, force that in there or try to make something happen on our own without God. And perhaps... The greatest example of scary Christians are those who pick and choose which attributes of the faith they want to live with. When I was a teenager, uh, the church I was attending had um, a controversy breakout. The, the students were playing a card game that some of the elders in the church were not comfortable with. We'll just put it there. And so they had a church-wide meeting and everybody was there, the teenagers were there. And the meeting was getting really ugly. And one of the elders in the church, a really nice old man, got up and said, we need to be careful with our words. Our calling right now is to be loving to these young kids. And this other guy got up, who was still angry, and he said, I don't care about love. I care about the truth. What he had done in that moment is he had just said, I've got this truth, and I don't care if I'm a bull in a china shop. I'm going to use it and I'm just going to bully other people around there. He was choosing which parts of the faith he wanted and leaving out the other parts. And we're not called to do that at all. We're called to patience, to gentleness, to loving kindness. We don't get to choose which of those are attributes of who we are. Because if we do choose, that's exactly the moment we become scary to the world. So it's not an invitation to become scary Christians. It's an invitation, rather, for us to be kind of weird. That we know in any moment, God could break through. 
God could, could, could bring life and, and peace to somebody. And we want to be a part of that. Living with the expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ is not just this future thing that we can push to the side. It shapes who we are right here and now. And so when the people heard James say this, they didn't think he was being irrelevant. They thought he was speaking a powerful message of God's presence here and now, that the truth of the future should be felt in the present. And we better shape up because the judge is standing at the door. Friends, we don't know the date, but we are called to know the power of Jesus' coming. And that should lead all of us to live out the principle of one in each and every moment so that we don't ignore our calling to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. Now, if you're still not convinced that, hey, this whole waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ is a good thing that we should do, well, I want you to consider this question. This is just a general question about who we are when we're impatient. This is the question. What kind of person are you when you have trouble waiting? Like, what would your kids say about you and your level of patience? What would your friends say? Like, what kind of person are you when you have trouble waiting? Because what we are called to be by Christ is to be people of hope. And the best way to let that hope get to other people around us is to by practicing patience and to live with an awareness that God could break through in any moment. And we want that to happen, but more importantly, we want to be a part of that and we want to know when it's happening. Friends, waiting is not about wasting time. It's about making the best use of the time we have. And if we can learn how to be good at waiting, then watch out. Number one, you're going to be weird. People are going to think you're weird. But number two, the good news of Jesus Christ is going to radiate off of your entire life. And others are going to know of the hope that you have in him. So friends, today is our invitation to practice the principle of one, to live with an expectation that God not only can break through, but God will break through. Maybe we'll never see the second coming of Jesus Christ. At least there's 1% of atheists who believe that he'll come. But do we put our trust in that? And does that shape us as Christians today? Let us pray together. Lord God, we are thankful for your word and how it encourages us to live with hope in each and every moment. Lord, you have called us through scripture today to live with patience, to wait patiently for your coming so that we might be shaped into people of hope and we might convey that hope with the way that we live and treat every single person in every single situation. Lord, I pray that we put the principle of one in place that we slow down, that we live more intentionally, and that we do the right things, not just because they're good to do, but because they open us up to the awareness that you can move in any moment, and we want to be a part of that. So Lord, during this busy holiday season, may we never lose sight of the hope that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. May we attend to each person we encounter with respect and dignity, but also the expectation that you might call us to bring them joy or peace or just a word of comfort to them. Lord, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to us, but will come again in glory. And for that, Lord, we can be truly thankful. Lord, it is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. At this time, would you rise in body or in spirit as we sing our final hymn, hymn number 454, Open My Eyes That I May See.
I would encourage you, if you have not had the chance to do so, to uh, go down to the holiday shop, which is down in the fellowship hall after uh, service. And if there's any items that are of interest to you or you think might be of interest to somebody else, I would encourage you uh, to go down there and purchase those. It does go for a great cause. Well, during the first service, I said this because we were singing that final hymn together. And for whatever reason, my eyes just drifted to the page right next to our hymn, and I found a prayer there that really, I think, was a word that God was speaking to me in that moment. So I was putting the sermon in practice. If you want to know if your preacher puts his sermons in practice, I try to, at least. But I did that morning. I want to share these words with you today. It's 456. O Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed, and use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears, that I may, this coming day, be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. Let us sing together. <laughs> 